to disrupt the entire um, the economic system what we have. Tea, for example, and I had a just chat. For me, tea industry is dead in 15 years because it is, unless you're a high brand, right, for what um, Malik said, right, your cost of production is 500 and you cannot sell at 600. This will be out. So there are two ways. Either you become a niche or you innovate. You can't have these people plucking tea. I mean, this is worse than slavery, right? We need to disrupt. How do we do this? The tea production has not changed for the last 150 years, right? The old business model, it's the same, right? And then I think this is where disruption is important, right? We need to find ways, vertical farms, high yield, production, and et cetera. And it has to come from private sector. And finally, it's our education system. We have uh, 200,000 A-level passing out with four, a, uh, four simple passes to enter university, and only 30,000 get into the university. That's right. So we have 170,000, and out of that 10,000 join private. The 160, right, either you have rich parents who will send you overseas, otherwise you end up as a three-wheel driver, if your parents have money, otherwise you have no chance. So we need to create jobs for the masses, right? and we have to reimagine our whole economy. And for that, what we need is not political leadership. What we need is a collective, very decisive leadership based on economics. That's right? There is no way Sri Lanka can uh, survive with $4,000 minimum we have to aim for 1,000, sorry, 12,000, right? That you'll bring the whole country up. And that you cannot do labor arbitrage. Our industries can't be based on labor. We need to go up the value chain, right? Uh, leadership is the most decisive thing. If we miss this, I don't think we can ever recover, right? Last we need chance. what Lee Kuan Yew did for Singapore. We need technocrats to run this country. Thank you. Thanks, Manu. I think one of the key points, key takes for me is uh, we are at the edge of uh, the way things are happening. And with the Industrial Revolution 4.0, things are going to change completely. And unless we start now, we will, uh, we will be history before it is late. At this point, and to connect what uh, Manu said, I would like to come to you, Malik. You touched a very important point. Now, we need to create jobs. We need to create opportunities. And uh, if I got it right, you were saying that we have this trading mentality because uh, that is the easiest way to make money. So why go through this whole uh, creation thing? Uh, so if we are to move into a real, real value-creating economy, which is not pure trading, I mean, yes. I remember one um, engineer who is into uh, business, he was saying, by importing and selling, you can be rich, but not the country. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think you can be proud because you are, both of you are adding value to the economy. And what are the things, uh, key things, uh, Malik, you think we should be looking at doing if you want to create this, not trading, but really real business uh, See, I think it has to be a combination of different things. One key thing that we've missed is we've been thinking We've got to export things we make in this country. But if you look at the Asian miracle, it's been FDI supply chain based. We've not plugged into global supply chains. If you look at China, I mean, now you've got their Huawei's and their powerhouses. What started China off five or 10 years ago, 60% of Chinese exports were from American and other countries who came in and utilized their skill sets. If you look at Thailand, world's biggest export of hard drives, of uh, you know, uh, flash drives, massive export of Toyota trucks. Now, do they make it from A to Z? No. It's supply chain means that you set up plants that adds 20, 30% value, so it starts. It's like an Apple iPhone, right? Trump is putting uh, tariffs on China, but the iPhone isn't made in China. It's assembled in China. The final value-added element in China is only about 5%. Most of the money is made offshore by Apple in Ireland, right? So it's not. China making the iPhone. It's an assembly. We've got to plug in. We never plugged in. Uh, to plug in, you need FDI. You need the 
proper system, you need consistent policies because no investor is going to come and set up a plant. Because really, if you look at the history of FDI, way back there was Motorola and various companies talking, but there's really not been a significant foreign FDI drive in manufacturing. So in my view, the moment you set something up, look at the countries when Trump put tariffs on China, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, all these countries benefited because people moved the manufacturing offshore. Now they can't move it here because we just didn't have those connections. So I strongly feel, apart from entrepreneurship, you know, creating your own brands, adding value. So for example, if you look at the gem and jewelry industry I was talking about earlier, our revenues are 300 million, 95% of our exports go in rough form, most of it smuggled. Uh, Hong Kong exports $30 billion worth of gems without a single gem underground. Uh, Thailand exports about 20 billion, about 50% of that input is from Sri Lanka as rough. Now, if you look at that industry, considering that 90% of our gemming has not been exploited, I mean, that could be a massive industry that could net 15, 20 billion dollars a year, eyes closed, uh, and employ thousands and thousands of people instead of people, you know, digging pits and, you know, just shuffling around, uh, you know, trying to find stones in, 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 in streams. So, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's looking at, um, you know, semi plugging into supply chains for India, for China, for Vietnam. So you've got to look at a mix of things, but you've got to have people who are able to look at it like a private sector would with a kind of a, a holistic thing and having a five year plan. You can't suddenly, you know, say, oh, okay, I'll do this today, I'll do that tomorrow. So it's just a matter of strategic planning. And I think we can easily, you know, give us, isn't it embarrassing that, you know, 40% of our, 50% of our able-bodied citizens are either in, in overseas, in Dubai, in the Maldives, uh, working for government service, underemployed. So actually, the number of people you've got to find jobs for is pretty tiny because most of our working age people are outside the country. Uh, or, you know, doing dead-end jobs in, in government service. So it's really not a huge problem. But ideally, we want to do it so that, I as Manu said about people working overseas, they come back and add value. There's got to be a reverse brain drain because there's no place like home, you know? And it started, but then again, it stopped. And even now, you're seeing net emigration at this point. I think this whole thing about losing hope, right? At one point, I was telling, when people jump boats, right? That's not migration. They think better to die than uh, be here. And with your insights into uh, the divisions that are being created, and uh, what is your take? What do you think? Now, one thing that you brought in here is the message that in the corporates, in the businesses, we look for talent, and then you bring talent together, and that's one way. And to prevent this trend going forward, because that's a very dangerous uh, flow, because if you want to bring FDIs and things like that, Right? This creates risks. Right? What are the things we should be really doing as a, a nation to bring this uh, connectivity of people together? Because in his speech, he made a point that promoting link language, promoting understanding is uh, one thing. What are the things that come to your mind? I think we have to look at it holistically. There is no one factor that is going to fix the difficulties that we have. Um, I firmly believe that we have to have good leadership, leadership with vision and strong leadership. Um, if we manage to get that piece right in the next couple of months that are coming ahead, um, I believe that strong leadership on the one side we have to have very good security systems on the other side because security should be number one, number two, and number three priority because without that, even good businesses get affected. We have seen the collapse. Community harmony. It, it is not a natural process anymore because when we see all the divisions and the problems that are happening internationally, it's not a natural trend. So we have to make sure that community Harmony is maintained by um, having individuals. Um, I mean, one of the simple things that are being proposed is to have a Harmony Act, where you um, counter hate speech. Uh, 
it is being proposed to have multi multi ethnic multi religious schools without dividing our schools among uh, through religious and ethnic lines because i think many of us who um, maybe not my but many of us who were born in the 60s we have gone to school with other <laughs> ethnic and religious um, individuals uh, groups so uh, we need to get that piece right and then we need to um, manage the cyberspace because a lot is being done to create extremism and uh, hatred using the the cyberspace so that has to be regulated and we need to have uh, the educational system has to has to come into place so i believe that as a government i mean if you look at uh, malik's presentation and what his dad has done he has look at looked at it holistically it is not only the economic he's looked at the welfare he's looked at empowerment he's looked at training his his staff so i believe that in a small form he's almost run something like a government with, with very good values and it works we need a similar system i think we had a similar system their people came back to sri lanka they were empowered they wanted to do many many projects and programs but if we start crushing the individual um, individual mojo of indiv people and if we start uh, if we do not empower individuals and institutions and organizations we are not going to get anywhere so holistically we need to look at the social angle the economy the security uh, the community angle um, as well as look at managing the cultural because we need to uh, build a, a culture a particular culture of a value based culture in this country and we already have these values um, so i believe that these are key aspects that we need to get in place we have to have values vision and we have to implement these things and we cannot do this without good leadership we have to ha have that peace in place uh there are so many questions that we think we can uh, take up but my red sign says times up is that really times up or <laughs> we're having fun <laughs> yes all right okay yeah savitri is going to hit me uh, uh so i avoid risks uh, listening to uh, uh jayanta you know it is i did i didn't want to come here only to i have to go back also <laughs> and uh, i think the final take is uh, if you look back and reflect on the dilma story i think the dilma story has a bigger message than what dilma has done for me they believe in this country they believe the potential of it and just like the uh, everest climbing they have been climbing a story uh, uh, mountain with a purpose i think if you start focusing on the purpose saying human beings are more important than everything else although you accountants uh, Uh, put us uh, as costs uh, in the business uh, <laughs> but i think if you focus on human beings a lot of things will come and i think to get up and go we need to look at three main things human focus technology focus and risk mitigation i think with that i would like to conclude uh, this session uh, sorry we couldn't take all the questions that popped up because that screen is red although this was white thank you very much you have been a wonderful audience thank you thank you very much deepal malik mano and also to dr makan um we just like to invite uh, mr moiz rehman ji chairman of the national conference technical committee and mr suleiman nishta who's the alternate chairman of the national conference technical committee to uh, present a thank you token to our moderator and panelists Firstly to uh, Malik Fernando Malik however you will be carrying two tokens one for your dad who initially set the landscape for this uh, for the session with his 
words of wisdom. So this is for Meryl J. Fernando to say a big thank you for everything he has done, not just for this session, but for what he has done for Sri Lanka. And this is for Malik Fernando for carrying the message through and being here today, like he said, at very short notice because his father left him in the lurch. The next is to Dr. Malkanti Hetiarachi. Thank you very much. You brought in a different perspective to the, the entire discussion. The entire discussion. To Mr. Mano Sekram, who has been a lighthouse, so to speak, for new innovative business areas and thought processes. And to Deepal Suryarchi for excellent moderation, although he didn't really have that much time to take in as much as he, we could have in this session. So to avoid that, thank you so much, gentlemen, and to Dr. Malkanti Hetiarachi too. To avoid this uh, lapse of time and being unable to get the most of our sessions, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to have you back here at 1.40. Those of you having lunch, uh, at uh, or who have been told to go to Sri Dharani restaurant, please do so because that is where your lunch is served. All the others to your various assigned venues. And to our audience at Galadari, please bear with us until uh, we get the technical uh, area sorted. The weather at the Galadari is not very, very good, very conducive for us. So there's been a little break in transmission, but we are getting that sorted ASAP. Thank you.